Hi, my name is Lauren Cecil, and I'm asking for the release of my dad, Craig Cecil. He has a life sentence without the possibility of parole for a marijuana charge and has been incarcerated uh, since 2002. So 14 years I've been without my dad, and being 28 years old, that's half my life. Please let him come home. Welcome to the War on Drugs, America's solution to locking up the supposed bad guys over 2.3 million of them, more than anywhere in the world, costing taxpayers an annual $80 billion. And according to the ACLU, there are roughly 3,278 people serving lifetime sentences without the option of parole for nonviolent offenses. Of those, 79% have been sentenced to die in prison for drug-related crimes. Despite legalization sweeping the nation, when it comes to cannabis, there are still people locked in prison for life. To say it is unfair is perhaps an understatement. And so begins the journey at Mary Jane to explore the stories of the voiceless victims sentenced to life without parole for marijuana-related crimes. The first-time offenders, the fathers, the framed, and then the lucky few who got out. After serving decades behind bars for crossing paths with marijuana at the wrong place and the wrong time, these are their stories. My name is Tom McMahon. I'm a criminal defense attorney at Margolin and Lawrence, where we specialize in marijuana-related cases. I currently chair the Marijuana Lifer Project, an organization devoted to providing assistance to inmates who have been essentially sentenced to life for marijuana-related nonviolent crimes in federal prison. Today, people kind of assume that with legalization sweeping state by state, that there aren't people in prison for life for this stuff, but there still are, and it just hasn't really been a priority with Congress. And that really kind of hits me as extremely unjust because it is, at the end of the day, a pretty harmless plant and really has been stigmatized for a long time, I think, to a detriment of American culture. It's stimulating, mind-expanding, safer to use than alcohol. It's the in thing, the hula hoop of the jet generation, and as much a part of growing up as smoking corn silk behind the back fence. Such are the myths concerning marijuana. In 1971, President Nixon designated hundreds of millions of tax dollars to locking up minority communities for newly classified substances, including marijuana, which was given the most restrictive categorization as a Schedule I drug, right alongside heroin. The number of people behind bars for nonviolent drug crimes increased dramatically by 700% from the years 1980 to 1997. My name is Amy Pova, and I received a 24-year sentence for MDMA ecstasy that um, my now ex-husband manufactured. He cut a deal, cooperated, named names, and he got three years probation because if you will work with the feds, uh, you're pretty good to go. So I got 16 politicians who supported my clemency, and then on July 7th, 2000, President Clinton signed my clemency, and I popped out the same day, and I went from thinking I was doing 24 years to all of a sudden I'm on the freeway, and I'm like, what just happened? So I started the CanDo Foundation. CanDo stands for Clemency for All Nonviolent Drug Offenders. Clemency can take several forms. The most common are through pardons in state prison, that would be the governor, the chief executive, or in federal prison, that would be the president. You can also receive a commutation of your sentence through a clemency application. America came from a place where we were thinking harsher sentences will result in deterring crime, 
And, you know, what's going to happen is the kingpins are going to be the ones who face severe punishments. But really, the reality is, you know, people who serve sentences for this are just kind of minor players or people like Craig, who may not really have known that the trucks that he was repairing and servicing were being used for transporting marijuana. Craig Cecil is 58 years old. He was incarcerated in 2002 for conspiracy to possess and intent to distribute marijuana. Craig owned a semi-truck tow and repair company. His company was usually hired by leasing companies to retrieve abandoned and damaged trucks. Some of the trucks Craig was called upon to retrieve were used to smuggle drugs. It is for this reason that Craig is serving a lifetime in prison. Craig is a good example of someone serving a de facto life sentence. I believe he's serving 30 years and he was originally convicted in 2002. Part of the confusion about cases like his revolves around conspiracy. Conspiracy in a drug crime is, they say you have to knowingly and willingly enter an agreement. But all they need now for proof is the word of somebody who's in a bad situation to simply testify, and they're trying to get their ass out of a crack. And so there's no tangible proof anymore. You can be liable for the objectives of a you know, wide-ranging conspiracy if you participated even in just a small way. We had a girl who gave her college roommate's mother a ride because her car was broken down and her mother was just gonna go pick up some drug proceeds. She got 10 years mandatory minimum just for giving a car ride to her college roommate's mother. Dale Green was just a middleman. This undercover cop was just driving down the road. Dale was standing on the side of the road, and the cop stopped him. The cop said, I'm looking for pot. Dale sold him $20 worth of pot and then was sentenced to life without parole after the cop identified him a day later. Craig, he basically got played in a scheme involving the DEA and undercover agents. The drivers of the trucking company said Craig had been part of the scheme in order to avoid prison time themselves, which is enough proof of guilt according to conspiracy law. Here's some warning signs. If you have a friend or if somebody enters your life and suddenly is pressuring you, unnatural pressure, I mean, the person just seems like they just won't stop, that is more than likely a government informant or somebody who's gotten in trouble and has been caught with some kind of drugs. And in order to escape the mandatory minimums, which usually is a mandate of 10 years or more, they need to provide substantial assistance. Substantial assistance is a legal term, which means you have to aid the government in the conviction of others. So the testimony of a co-conspirator or somebody who is in trouble is enough to support a guilty verdict alone. And that's in my jury transcript. We reached out to Craig, and he wrote to us about the life he left behind and his life behind bars. I have two children from my marriage, and I speak to them at least once per week by phone. Curtis, however, died on December 27, 2014, and I still have a tough time with that. He took prescription pills and alcohol. He was 23 years old. My brother passed away, and that was hard, you know, not, not having your dad there for that. You know, he filed all his paperwork, he had good behavior and everything, and they still wouldn't let him come. Um, to his son's funeral. Before my experiences in the justice system, I would have never believed a person could be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for any drug offense. Even now, I get stopped by BOP officers and asked if it's true that I'm sentenced to life for marijuana. When my daughter tells people that her dad is in prison for life, she says the first question is always, who did he kill? When I was convicted and when I was sentenced, I was in disbelief, but I was also sure this was a mistake which would be corrected on appeal. Is this really the justice system? 
Having now served 15 years, Craig is actively working towards clemency. It's extremely rare, and his clemency petition was denied, so he's still in prison. Some of the most deserving people didn't get clemency, and the reason for that, I feel, is because DOJ gave most of the power to the prosecutor, and if your prosecutor didn't want you to get it, your case likely never made it over to the White House, so they probably never even saw it. They just deny it. While not everyone's petition for clemency gets approval, we spoke to one man who did find freedom. My name is George Martorano. I spent 32 plus years in federal prison, nonviolent first offender for cannabis. I was sentenced in 1984. Life, no parole. I didn't count the months, the weeks, or the days. I counted the Christmases. They put me in for five Christmases in solitary. In the beginning, you started missing a lot of things. You started missing the women in your life, uh, family in your life, the friends in your life. So when the years go by, and then the miss, the miss gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You start missing uh, the smell of a small flower. You start missing uh, the chirp of a bird, the coo of a dove. Daybreak, you start to understand yourself. You start to realize what life is about. Being in the worst prison in America, there's two things you're gonna be. You're gonna be beast or better. Early on in my solitary, I says, I'm gonna be better. While in prison, George authored more than 31 books. He developed a creative writing course, The Right to Life, which has assisted numerous inmates in earning GEDs. In 2015, George became eligible for the Department of Justice's Compassionate Release Program, which sought to reduce overcrowding and provide relief to drug offenders who received harsh sentences. Now back in the free world, George is sharing his experiences as a motivational speaker. A number of Marijuana Lifer Project members were successfully released under the Obama administration. However, a number of people were denied clemency under that outgoing administration. And with regards to marijuana laws, which largely have been enforced with significant racial disparities, and we're not even talking about that right now, but that's kind of like the big problem here. There are staggering racial disparities in sentencing in this country. We found that black Americans are disproportionately represented in the nationwide prison population, but even more so among those who are serving life without parole for nonviolent crimes. In our research, we found that 65% are black, 18% are white, and 16% are Latino. I see a lot of those issues getting worse right now in this country. In January of 2018, Attorney General Jeff Sessions issued a reversal of the Cole Memo, which was initially set in place by the Obama-era Department of Justice and helped to keep the DOJ from overturning states' marijuana legalization initiatives. Dialing back the hands of time, Sessions ordered all U.S. attorneys to enforce federal marijuana laws and prosecutorial principles established in the 1970 Controlled Substance Act. I am very disturbed by the, the movement at the national level by the Attorney General and others under the current administration to sort of go back to the to the battle days of the war on drugs. And the declaration by the Attorney General almost classifying marijuana as an existential threat to the well-being of this country is laughable and I think is very harmful. And uh, so I wanted to make sure that where I can that we begin having a different conversation at the national level. San Francisco's DA, George Gascon, has taken matters into his own hands with plans to dismiss over 3,000 misdemeanor convictions that date back before California's legalization and is currently reviewing and seeking to resentence nearly 5,000 felony convictions. There's certainly reason to hope, but this is like systemic. So I think it's important to be hopeful, but I think it's also important to acknowledge the ways we still have to go. Writing letters to your 
representatives, you know, voting in your local election, keeping track of recent criminal justice reform. I mean, it goes a long way for them to know that people on the outside care and know who they are. You know, every little bit helps. And the more people that are collectively doing little things, even if it's just sharing stories on social media, it builds towards a critical mass of actually getting to a tipping point where we change these laws for good. My dad has a very cruel joke and says, you know, I guess I should have killed somebody because then I'd be out by now. And it's crazy and true and sad. This horrible mass incarceration of all these people. Something needs to be done. I'd really like for him to come home and everybody else whose family is suffering their loved ones to come home as well. Um, thank you for your time. The drug war decimated the minority communities. There's no question about that. Black people are more likely to be sentenced to longer sentences, more likely to be arrested. And a lot of this is the root of early practices following slavery. It really does feel like a vision from hundreds of years ago rather than happening in this country today.